morning. Good morning. Welcome to Madison United Methodist Church. If you're here in our sanctuary, we are glad you are here. And hopefully you have one of these handy dandy bulletins with you this morning. And if you're watching us online, we're glad that you have also come. It is, um, you can find a bulletin and any information about worship at mumcnc.com. Well, let us be called to worship together this day. The Lord comes to us this day. Are you ready? We are ready. The Lord challenges us to be in ministries of peace and hope. Are you ready? We are ready. Let us praise God who calls us to serve God by helping others. Praise be to God who has given us hope and peace. Amen. We continue our worship by the singing of our opening hymn, number 73, O Worship the King. Thank you. Thank you. So let us go to God in private devotional prayer.
merciful and loving God, you have been so gracious to us this week. We have seen your work in the world, and I'm sure that there are things coming to mind to each one of us where we have seen goodness reign. But Lord, we also have seen when hatred takes its course and that it leads people and places and things to do not great things for one another and to hurt one another. And Lord, we pray for those situations, those people. We pray that we are people that exit out of this sanctuary this morning and that we are kind and gracious to all we meet, that we share the love that you have given us with others, that we are trying to be better each and every day. And Lord, we have mourning losses that we come here with, maybe challenges in our own lives or people that we have lost either to death or simply that have are no longer with us in our relationships and we mourn those losses but we ask that you help us to carry on to continue on the journey and that we know that no matter what happens in this life that we can count on you and trust in you and lord we are just so thankful that you hear our prayer that you extend to us kindness and a graciousness that we can accept and that we cannot match in this life. So Lord, thank you again for hearing those prayers that we have lifted up. Thank you for being present with us in this worship service and helping us receive whatever you have to give to us this day. May we hear your word, may we experience you in song, may everything that we do this morning be a way that which we can connect with you more clearly, more, more concisely, and also that we can feel your presence more strongly. And we ask all of this as we pray the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And our children are here for Martha Sharp to come up and offer the children's moment. You all just appeared, like we prayed, and there you are. So that's well, great. What'd you say, Sarah? Oh, it's not working. Oh. Look, it's not picking it no, up. No, it's, it's not picking it up. It might be my phone. Okay. It's right. okay. Well, we we're just glad you're here. here. Ford, are you going to join us this morning? Yeah. Oh, you're going to stay put. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> I talk loud enough that you'll hear me anyway. Uh, the scripture that Pastor Tracy's going to read you later on is about faith. What is faith? Big ch children can answer too. What is faith? Love. It could be love. Excitement. It could be excitement. Um, give me an example of faith. Strong. Strong, hopefully. Believe. Very good. Uh, I have faith that that light is not going to fall on Miss Sarah. Now, I can't, I can't see, I'm not sure that's a good example of faith. <laughs> I hope it is. <laughs> Miss Sarah hopes it is. Yes. Faith is also thinking about believing. Now, do you know that I'm here? You can see me, you can hear me, you can feel me. I know you're here, but sometimes we have to have faith. Can we see God? Can we hear him? No. Not audibly. We might in our heart. Um, we feel him when we feel God's love, but we don't actually feel God. But do we know he's there? Yep. Well, I need a volunteer. I need somebody to come up. And it sits. I got a, a guy. Whoa, got messed up. Communion there. Oh, well, stand up. Do you trust me? Okay. I met you earlier. I'm gonna I'm gonna use reds instead of green since you're a guy. 
I'm going to blindfold him, I hope. Can you see anything? No. You sure? Yep. And you're truthful? Okay. <laughs> Trust me. Have faith in me. You can't see. I'm going to lead you, okay? okay? And you just trust me. And we're just going to go forward. We're going to turn a little bit. You notice he's hanging on to his dinosaur head, so I'm not sure how much he trusts. Okay, we're going to turn around. We're going to back. And we keep walking. You see anything? Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to turn you around again right here. And tell you to sit down, please. There's something there. There you go. Thank you very much for trusting. And that is sometimes what we kind of have to do with the Lord. I wouldn't say it's blind trust, but faith that we can do that. And there comes another one. You'll have to ask him about faith. We can't see it or feel it, but we know about faith. You trusted me and we trust God to lead us in the way we should go. So let's have a prayer. Thank you, God, for loving us and for being there with us all the time. We're so glad we can have faith in you, believe in you, and most of all, that we can trust in you. Amen. Okay. I'm going to go with Miss Sarah. As a matter of fact, you can go with the bunch of us. Going back.
We understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out a place that he was to receive an inheritance, and he set out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he saved for a time the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, he received power and recreation, even though he was too old, and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as a good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven, as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. For people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking the land they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. May God bless the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. Well, I read this story or Sometimes I read kind of strange stories, and um, I read about this elevator evolution. And there's, it's happening in so many, some cities around the country, and it's got an official name, a new technology. It's called the Destination Elevator. That's kind of cool, isn't it? But others call it the Wonkavator. Anybody see Willy Wonka? Again, I'm bringing up a reference from my childhood, so everybody. Okay, thank you, Taylor. <laughs> It's named after that glass elevator that would immediately take Willy Wonka and his companions anywhere in the chocolate factory that they wanted to go. I always wanted one of those as a kid. I thought that would be so cool. These elevators are a destination sensation. No hesitation, no headaches. And here's how it works. Say you want to get to the ninth floor. And you're in this busy office building. You simply walk up to the elevator kiosk in the hobby and type in the number nine and the computer analyzes your request and uses sophisticated software algorithms to figure out the most direct route and efficient way to respond to your request so that you won't have too much traffic and any demands on that moment to moment. It also calculates the optimum route for you to take of each car based on the number of passengers that will be on the elevator. It has weight sensors, which doesn't excite me, and the cars estimate the number of passengers already abroad, aboard and they help decide whether to drop off passengers before picking up new ones. I don't know if I want an elevator to know that much about me, but after all of that, what happens most instantaneously the computer tells you which of the elevators around you is going to be stopping on the ninth floor on its next trip up. So when the elevator arrives, you simply get on and you're whisked away almost immediately and directly to your floor in much less time than a traditional elevator. And since the computer groups passengers by floor, more elevators become available to public because there are fewer stops. Plus, since there are no buttons, this is an important part, there's no chance of someone getting on that elevator and going like this. <laughs> and you stop again every floor. That all sounds great, right? We're gonna install one in the church next week. No, I'm kidding, we're not. We don't even have a second floor. So, um, but, while many people are happy with this 20 to 30 percent reduction in wait time in these destination elevators and what they provide, others are less enthusiastic. New users may experience a rude awakening, for example, if they simply stroll into the lobby and jump on the first elevator that opens. 
they may find themselves having no control over where they're going. Can you imagine that? Getting on an elevator and having absolutely no control of where you get off. That's kind of scary. It is. I know. Tell me about it. It's scary. Actually, um, Rupert Bardock said that they put these in his New York, uh, one of his New York buildings, and somebody put these new elevators in, and nobody knows how to use them, so no one uses them. And so some of the elevators have to provide greeters in order to train people on how to use the elevators. Resistance to new technology isn't new in itself. In the history of elevators, for example, people generally complained when human operators were replaced by automated elevators in 1950. What may be more telling in this case, however, is that the objection seemed to be less about the technology and more about the freedom of choice. Truth is, many of us rather retain control and keep our options open. Whether we're getting into an elevator or making life decisions. Giving up control is not easy. It's certainly not easy when we're trying to have go to our destination. It's a hard sell if I said, today I'm gonna to make all the choices for you. You'd be right in there like, sure. <laughs> We will always try to manipulate a system to ensure that our choices get priority. During rush hour at a, at a hotel in Times Square, for example, some guests try to override the system by punching their floor on the numbers multiple times in hopes that they're gonna get there faster. And instead, the system slows down. When it comes to that walk evader, there's just no substitute for a little bit of learning and a lot of trust if you want to get where you're supposed to be. The writer of Hebrews is talking about a walk of air. It makes it clear that faith in God works the same way. Destination faith is like destination elevator. It involves making a choice and getting on board to where God is leading. The who's who's list of faithful persons listed in Hebrews 11 were all people who went willingly into a buttonless spiritual elevator. They got on and they stepped into new lands and new situations where they could not rely completely on their own choices. They had to rely on God. For provisions and protections and all kinds of things. It wasn't speed or efficiency or self-interest that drove them, but rather the assurance and conviction of faith. You know, when I look around our world, I wonder how much of us have faith nowadays. It seems like, I wonder who we have faith in, what systems we have faith in. Faith is kind of hard to come by. So I wonder if we actually define faith in words that we understand. Faith, to me, means it is the confidence that one's invisible and unrealized hopes will become a visible reality. It's having faith and confidence that our unrealized hopes will become a visible reality. Whether boldly or tentatively at first, the patriarchs and matriarchs of the Old Testament made choices to trust God despite present circumstances and unknown futures. And perhaps there's no better example in, of this kind of faith in scriptures than that of Abraham, whom the writer of Hebrews discusses at length. God meets Abraham in Mesopotamia and tells him to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, even though he went not knowing where he was going. Okay, I want you to think about this, because I just, I thought about this, 
Madison. I can't even go around Madison or Mayotte without my GPS. So heading out in, in North Carolina to me without GPS is the scariest thing I can ever do. Because I'm from Oklahoma where you can see right in front of you. And in North Carolina, you can't see what's coming. And you may end up in the middle of a forest somewhere and it's very terrifying to me. But just think of that. Think of how Abraham must have felt. He's not just setting out for, you know, Greensboro. He's setting out for a complete inheritance and not knowing exactly where he's going. Abraham's only choice is to say yes to following God. And that's a choice of faith. And it was for that choice that the patriarch received approval from God. From the moment he punched into his willingness to travel, he just said, okay, I'm ready to travel. God took over and took control of Abraham's destination, sending him to the land that he had been promised, where he wandered from place to place living in tents. That's another exciting thing. I can't imagine that. You're going to a place you don't know, and then you're living in tents, just not knowing what tomorrow will bring. My friend right now, um, one of my friends, uh, she decided to um, go on an adventure. So she, and I watch these HDTV shows all the time where they redo vans. So she redid one of her, her van into one of those places that has everything in it. And it's, and she drives around the country and she just goes to different places and lives in her van and she loves it. She is having the best time of her life. And I say, so where are you heading to this time? She says, somewhere in North Dakota. I said, where are you heading? To? Somewhere in Florida. Where are you heading today? Somewhere in California. I, I say, somewhere? <laughs> that scares me to death. I'm like, well, where's the plan? Where's, where's your next steps? Where, where are the five places you're going to stay? Where are you going to make sure you park safely? Da, 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 da. She's like, I'm going on my adventure and trusting God will lead the way. And God has led her to so many awesome adventures and awesome people that she has met. It is the journey rather than the destination itself that proved Abraham's faithfulness and proves our faithfulness. Abraham's faith was based solely on his budding relationship with God and the potential of the promises of God and the promises of land and descendants that were still only a dream when Abraham set out with no man and a wife who was barren. Abraham himself was as good as dead in his old age, and yet he still stepped abroad at God's invitation. Even though he would not see the fulfillment of all of those promises in his lifetime, Abraham and his descendants did not seek an opportunity to return to the ground floor and revisit where they were. Instead, they saw themselves as strangers and foreigners of the earth who looked ahead to a better country, and that is a heavenly one. God was at the controls. Therefore, the destination, wherever it may be, was going to be a good one. Now, how many of us think that? Wherever God leads us, no matter if there's some bumps in the road, the destination is going to be a good one. For them, faith was complete trust in God without a specific and comprehensive floor plan for the future. It's really easy to talk about faith. I mean, I can talk about faith till the cows come home. But it's a lot harder to embrace it. We want to give ourselves over to God, but we like to know some of the plans God has and maybe the destination and the details in advance. We'd love to know if God would just simply give us the floor plan. Just, just give us the plan. That's all we need. And a schedule, where we're supposed to be, when, what's going to happen. But in order to find God's will in our lives, we've got to let go. 
There is no formula, no magic bullet, no, no, nothing that how our what we decide and how our lives play out, we're gonna we're gonna get the right destination that we need. If we got off even a four or two before God, uh, before follow God's plan, who knows what will happen? I mean, we, we don't know what will happen. We might be in some circumstances, and, and but God will still see us through. We might even have some finances, our family hurts, or old hurts that stand in the way before us that don't even allow us to get on the elevator because we're so fearful. We're focusing on the destiny, and we're Losing sight of where maybe God wants to call us in the meantime. The truth is that God's will for us isn't bound up in the final destination. Be it a career choice or to the ministry, God's will is for us to be in relationship to God and with God. To trust God with everything in our lives. And to live each day in God's presence. And when it comes to God, the journey is the destination. So like Abraham and others mentioned in Hebrews 11, we may never really see the fulfillment of our own potential. That may only be realized by our spiritual descendants. Faithfulness isn't about what it isn't, what isn't for me, what's it about for me, but rather what's possible for God and me to accomplish together in the present, realizing that everything we do for God is part of God's larger purpose for the world. So do we want to learn faith like Abraham? That's not rhetorical, you get an answer. <laughs> if we want to learn in faith like Abraham and those who are spoken of in Hebrews 11, we've got to enter the elevator and trust that it's going to where God wants it to go for our lives. We've got to let go of the controls and not want to push all the buttons. We've got to just be ready to be on the journey and not necessarily know where the destination lies. I think that's why Holy Communion is so important to us as Christians because this mystery of faith, when Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples, they were very scared about the future. Jesus was going to die and they weren't even quite sure that was going to happen, but, but they knew something was going to happen. And here they were having the last meal they were going to have with Jesus. And Jesus was going to send them off into these mission fields, and they had no idea how to do it on their own. So in this meal, Jesus takes them and says, I'll be with you. I'll be with you through the bread. I'll be with you through the cup. And how long has that been a part of? of our spiritual journey. This has meaning because it strengthens us, it gives us Christ in our lives so that we can continue on this journey and realize that even if we're not in control, it will be okay. And this table is open for everyone. Christ invites to his table everyone. All who love Jesus, anyone who Jesus loves. This table is open for anyone. And if you'll turn in your hymnals to page 12. May we confess together the bowl that's on page 12. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have failed to be in your church. We have not loved your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not loved our pride in me. Forgive us your pray. Free us joyful obedience. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves 
God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. May you show signs of peace to one another. You don't have to move out of your seats, but simply share peace and say peace to one another in the pews. Just offer each other a piece of Christ. Peace of Christ. <laughs> peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. As forgiven and reconciled people, we offer ourselves and our gifts to God that are offering this morning. There are offering plates on the entrance and exits if you're here in our sanctuary. And if you're online, you can go to mdmcnc.com and you can go to our giving tab.
close our service with our closing hymn, number 369, Blessed Assurance. Please stay and sing with us, please. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 